Well, I'm very honored to be here for this occasion, uh, even though it's a very sad occasion. In some sense, it's a joyous occasion. And I will celebrate this in part with uh, some co-authors who are students of Gary's, uh, uh, John Eric Humphreys, who's a student uh, in one of his last, in fact, I think in his last uh, course that he taught, a TA, and then Greg Veramendi, uh, who is a student of a student uh, of Gary Becker. And so this really is a paper heavily influenced by Gary Becker's work. Now we know that human capital and the education and human capital more generally was a central theme in Gary's life, his work and contribution. It was really a very major contribution. And it's staggering to realize that the basic theory he formulated was out in a published form uh, when he was 32 years old and certainly in the book when he was 34 years old. So very early on, he created an entire literature which has literally hundreds or if not thousands, I should say, of books and, and, and certainly hundreds of thousands of articles written on it. In his 1964 book, which is a masterful compilation of many different ideas uh, and it put together a literature that had been dispersed. Others had thought about human capital. Adam Smith talked about human capital. Marshall talked about it. But the 62 paper in the Journal of Political Economy and then the book, 1930, a 1964 book, really was a fundamental paper that put together, or a set of ideas that put together uh, really basic, um, uh, unified, a bunch of very diverse behaviors that nobody had thought of before within a common framework. So I'm going to focus on, and we're going to focus really on just one very narrow question, which turns out not itself to be a very narrow question. The reason why Gary Becker actually started working on this, at least the way he describes it in the book and also in many different talks over his lifetime, was that he was brought in to the National Bureau, and then located in New York, uh, to investigate whether or not the United States had the right amount of schooling. And in order to invest that, investigate that question, he wanted to compute and did attempt to compute and started a whole literature in computing the so-called rate of return to schooling. And he posed this question, which had been posed for him, actually. Is there underinvestment or overinvestment in education? And this is a problem uh, that's been addressed and it continues to be addressed. But early on, even in the 1962 JPE paper and then oh, throughout his life's work, this question was broadened to consider not just the monetary benefits, but also to consider the effects of education and human capital more generally on health, crime, voting, social participation, and, and many other activities. Now that question, the original question, remains unanswered to this day. And unfortunately, this talk will not really answer that question but it'll give some ingredients to answer that question and talk about various ways that people have tried to address it and offer some partial solution to this, uh, to, to resolution to this question. One of the questions that he raised, and had been raised even earlier in a paper, in a book written by Kuznets and, and uh, Friedman uh, that uh, uh, had, had was heavily criticized by a director of NBER, uh, was whether or not the returns that people nominally observed to education were all due to ability. There was an ability bias literature, and Gary talked about that, discussed it openly, and discussed it in many different ways over the rest of his life. <clears throat> and I want to talk about that with a somewhat broader view of ability. What do we know from the raw data? These are kinds of data that I think Gary would have been happy to put up and I think are consistent and show essentially the, the, what, what we can see is at least an empirical relationship and an adjusted empirical relationship between education and, um, and various uh, social and economic outcomes. So if we look, for example, in these columns, there are three columns here. This is for wages, and this is the present value of wages. I'll describe the data a little bit later, but it's NLSY data, with data sets that are widely used in the United States. Uh, what we find is essentially that if we look at the raw data, look at the raw difference between people who are high school graduates and dropouts, uh, it's people who, have, who are just high school graduates, those who stop at some college but don't finish college, four-year college graduates, this dark column shows a strong uh, effect. If we adjust for it by looking at things like family background and various measures of ability, both social, both cognitive and non-cognitive ability, we still find strong effects. There are real effects, and this has been documented many, many years, and Becker himself in a 64 book discusses this. Less standard, but as a whole literature doing this, is looking at the effects on health. And if I had enough time, you didn't give me enough time, so I won't 
Uh, <laughs> no, no, we, ha we have a lot of different outcomes that we could have actually talked about, but you can see the same general pattern. Even after adjusting for ability, even after adjusting for measures of family background, you still find strong effects of education. Now, Becker posed this question, and it looked like a very innocent question. Relative to the way the literature was in 1964 and way economists were going about doing things, he suggested that we uh, compute the rate of return as that value which allowed us to sort of equalize the return, the, 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 the earning streams that individuals would get from different levels of schooling. So a high school graduate compared to a college graduate. There could be years when a college graduate was getting negative earnings or in taking, and then there'd be payments for costs. So these were, this was a standard formula, and this actually triggered an entire literature, people estimating that. Giora Hanok wrote a very famous paper in the late uh, 60s that was very highly cited and used for a wide uh, variety of uh, purposes. But later, and I say later, we're talking 1966, so Gary was 36 years of age. Um, he, with Barry Chiswick, developed what we now know of as a version of the Menser equation. Menser perfected it. Uh, Gary Becker was a very strong uh, and very, very, uh, very strongly supportive of all of uh, Jacob Menser's work. But what became equation one, which is a familiar tool in trade to all labor economists, was basically that you could compute this rate of return, instead of looking at these earnings streams and doing this discounting, by running this kind of regression at an age around age 30, 35, which, which was discussed actively in the literature. And Jacob added the important notion of looking at uh, schooling at experience uh, education. So this was the literature, I would say, around 1974, when, so some 40 years ago. But you'll notice in this particular equation, Already there appeared, and it appeared early on in the, in, the, in the Becker and Chiswick paper and in Mincer's book, that there was heterogeneity among individuals, that there was an important component of this, that the rate of return, that rho sub i, varied among people, and people would have different schooling levels. And this led to a whole literature, a huge literature. Eddie worked on this question, I worked on this question, many people here worked on this question. And this early literature, I'd say up through 74, ignored many of these problems, but this started a flowering of literature. So for example, there was a notion that if we go back to this equation, that the rate of return would be correlated with the level of schooling. And so that was the notion that yes, if this really was a rate of return, and conditions under which that was true were, were debated and discussed, but if that was a rate of return, the question was there was heterogeneity among that, you'd think that might be correlated with the rate of return to schooling. And, uh, and Sherwin-Rosen really talked about this question. And, uh, and then another question was essentially the human capital concept as initially developed was one of uh, kind of a little mysterious. It was this substance out there, some people called ether. And you know, it was just something out there. And this became refined in work by Willis and Rosen, uh, later work by myself and Sedlicek, where we put into these models the notion of multiple skills and comparative advantage, that certain people would have different uh, advantages and the certain schooling levels would be associated with sorting into occupations and to educations. And then a huge literature ensued of uncertainty, learning, updating, and then option values. It's very interesting, in the earliest papers on human capital, the 62 Journal of Political Economy paper that Ted Schultz uh, I guess it was the issue that Schultz really authorized and sort of started with, where the literature really came together and crystallized. There's a paper by Burton Weisbrod actually talking about option values, the fact that just comparing two different earning streams was not enough, really, that in fact if you go from A to B, you can also maybe go on to C. And I think that, was, that created a whole literature too, which continues to this day. And Gary also talked early on, and this was an important component, that the actual costs of schooling were not just tuition. They were foregone earnings. He thought that was a very important point. But then the literature later found that that wasn't even enough by itself to explain the schooling choices, that there were these mysterious psychic costs. There were these components that had to do with non-pecuniary returns, which was, I think, and, and to Gary's point of view, an unsatisfactory component of the theory that somehow we had to rely on it. And again, a whole literature has ensued where people are looking at the different ways to fix the standard model. And then, of course, in terms of Gary's later work, he started integrating. This was early on in the Wojtynski lecture, but certainly by the mid-'70s and in the-'80s, he was looking at the role of uh, the family in shaping schooling decisions. 
and is a lot of important work that actually continues to this day is actually understanding the role of the family in creating uh, intergenerational opportunity, not only in financing schooling, but passing on values and, and, uh, and, and, and influencing the, uh, the child's schooling in various ways, including by targeting, by paying payments, uh, and not just a, a pure altruistic system, but a system of paternalism. Well, we know this literature has, has started a whole, a whole literature. I mean, there are all these, each of these topics could be the topic of a, of a seminar, a whole seminar, as we could have days on all the different papers that were spawned just by that early work. I want to talk a little bit about the theory, the, the modern theory of returns. And it was spawned, I think, uh, in terms of the structural work. There are many people uh, looking at this, uh, Comey and Malachuk early on. But there was a basic human capital model, which was basically a framework which is still very widely used. And it spawned the literature, which is sometimes called the structural model. And without going into the details, because we don't have time, it's kind of a very standard model for those who've seen it, people are choosing among alternative activities over their lifetime. There's a per period reward for each of those activities, M, uh, cap M of those activities, and individuals are selecting those activities to maximize the, present, the, the value function. So before, when Gary was writing, I think the first paper in econometric anyway that used the, val the Bellman equation was Phelps, 1962, which was about the time that Gary was doing this. A hallmark of Gary's work was that he stayed with the literature. He didn't stop with the tools that he had in 1962 or 1972 or 1982. And he encouraged this. And in fact, this is a, a work done, I'm just viewing a standard framework, that was done actually by uh, a postdoc here at the University of Chicago, Ken Wolfen, who stayed here uh, and, uh, and, and spoke very uh, strongly for many years, still speaks strongly about the influence that Gary had on his work. So then a lot of people were very interested in computing the value function, which had within it a way to think about option values in a coherent way. And this was then something that many people looked at, and this created, again, a whole literature which continues as we speak. So you get the current reward plus the continuation value of going on. And you have multiple choices. And the choice could be continuing on in the state or continuing on in another state. And this leads to a very simple decision rule. Instead of just computing the rate of return, which was actually implicit here, if we think about discounting value functions, but that's going to take me way off target. Uh, so I'm going to, uh, to focus on this. The, the very simple thing is that the value of schooling, as we see, including all the expectations that agents form, if all of that is embodied and taken into account, the value of staying on versus the next best day, you continue on with your schooling. Very intuitive idea that individuals would choose their schooling under uncertainty with some imperfections with various costs. So this led to this very large literature on structural equations. I'm not going to go through this table. I'm giving you a familiar set of objections, the benefits and the limitations. There's a huge literature that talks about both the benefits and the limitations. The benefits of writing down, estimating these equations are, of course, clearly interpretable parameters. The limitations are that frequently very specific functional forms are used. People are making very strong assumptions, which are disputed in the literature. And this creates, again, a whole set of discussions where people are saying, well, we really shouldn't go through this. The one factor that I would point out, though, is the key limitation for the current literature is that when people have actually fit these models, what they found is that psychic cost components, these very kind of unpleasant components uh, that are not very clearly understood, you know, do you like going to school, do you li like going to school, actually are driving a lot of the structural models. And people find that an unsatisfactory feature. So then people have turned increasingly to what's called the, the treatment effect literature, which is also a version of, uh, of uh, 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 a way to think about this approach. But then the question became that if this row, this rate of return that varies among individuals, varies among people, what do we actually mean by the treatment effect? There are a lot of different, as long as you're in a world with a simple, uh, re, simple coefficient, linear coefficient on schooling, no heterogeneity, no correlation, we're in a world where we can answer a very simple question. But the world got more complicated as we really started to understand. And Gary strongly supported this kinds of investigations looking at this, at this, at this question. And so the treatment effect literature has some questions uh, and benefits and limitations and all. Uh, what's less clear about it, the structural model gives you very clear answers to certain questions, but they're frequently very controversial. People don't like taking particular functional form positions. 
People don't know exactly, ex uh, like, like exactly all the assumptions about information, markets, updating, all of these things which, are open, which, are, which can be very controversial in specific models. I guess to turn it around, the treatment effect literature, a lot of the empirical literature is criticized because it doesn't take into account all those features. And so what we want to do today is essentially present a halfway house, which essentially allows us to address this question. It sounds like a compromise, and uh, it is, but I think it's an informative compromise because it means that we can actually go part way towards the structural literature. Um, this isn't a drug halfway house stating it. <laughs> we're, not, right, we're not on methadone, um, uh, although you may think so. Um, but, but there is a halfway house here, and, uh, and, and what we really want to do is consider a bridge, which actually allows us to go further. So we can individual, actually, the treatment effect literature is heavily criticized. A lot of symposia, the J Journal of Economic Literature has published several reviews in the last year. Ken Wolpen has a book where he's talking very actively about uh, structural estimation and its benefits. John Russ, surprisingly, in a very eclectic and open-minded survey, points out that there are limits to structural estimation. So we're responding to that. But what we want to consider is a bridge between these literatures that allows there to be choice, but doesn't over-parameterize the model and tells us what the next step should be. So there is a violent controversy. Violence is too strong a word, I guess, but there is a lot of disagreement. And what I want to consider is a framework that allows us to incorporate a lot of these recent findings so we can put in comparative advantage. We can talk about dynamic sequential updating. We know that the early schooling literature typically ignored the kind of schooling decisions, but schooling decisions are taken dynamically. People learn about themselves. And we can also look at who benefits. So where are the treatment effects strongest? It's not just a question, there's a treatment effect and that we get some effect at some margin which is unspecified. We can actually identify where and who those people are and at what margins policy might be operative. It's consistent with rationality, but it doesn't impose it. In the following, in, in, and I'll explain that in a minute. And it can identify, though, features of a dynamic model so that we can ask, well, what would the next step of a fully specified structural model look like, and how can we go beyond the kind of standard approach looking at treatment effects? Um, and so we, we can then essentially find out who benefits and who loses and do with the kind of accounting that's really relevant for understanding economic policy. So this is, a, a, this is just a, an example, uh, and it's, a, it's an example of what sequential schooling decisions would look like. Actually, a more complicated version of this would put in age. We could decide it each year. But we can see people can graduate high school. They can go on to college. People can drop out. They can do various options. And in fact, we know that all the different options are that it's not all going to be summarized in years of schooling. It's going to be summarized in a lot of different states that individuals may occupy. And so just some notation, they're going to be in a very simple framework today. We're going to consider choices at each node, binary choices. And people are deciding whether to go on or not go on at each node. And they can stop. And, 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 and they can stop and stay at that node. And we want to talk about notation about people who get to a decision node and people who then are taking subsequent choices. I don't think this was in the original human capital book. Ideas were there, but the dynamics came later, and I think it's an important contribution to the existing literature. And so what we try to do in this paper, and these are the contributions, we try to unify the literature on a variety of causal effects. So the idea is to really contribute to the causal effects literature. And we do want to see exactly what it is. We want to try to put a little more economic interpretation and find where in the, in the distribution for whom, for which groups of individuals there are benefits and their costs of, of, uh, of education and, uh, and what other traits there might be. I should also point out that, uh, oh well, no, no, let, me, let me point it out as I come to it. There's also selection on gains, which has been found to be substantial. Uh, and we find that linearity, which is actually not imposed in the original Becker-Chiswick model, the idea that rate of return is somehow linear in schooling, that became later, that became a convention that was easy to use because it justified least squares and it let one instrument identify all the return to all different levels of schooling, uh, we know that that's actually decisively rejected. So that, that modification has to be made. And we also find, however, that the continuation values that were neglected early on in this literature are really quite important. Uh, and there's substantial sorting on both cognitive and social and emotional skills. Now, early on, when Becker was talking about uh, the rate of returns and what are the determinants of who goes to schooling, 
He talked about some of these things, like your entrepreneurial motivation. Who is motivated? Who is, who is engaged? Who is sort of open to ideas and to experience? And so we do find, contrary to a literature that people has somehow emerged, which I think is kind of a misstatement of the literature, ability bias is important. It's always been important. That's not to say there aren't substantial effects. So the literature kind of posed this question that it was either a causal effect of education or ability. There's definitely ability sorting, both on cognitive and non-cognitive uh, skills. But what we also find is that for high ability individuals are the ones who actually are benefiting from college graduation. And so the idea of universal college for all, which is sometimes put forward in the political domain these days, is really a bad idea. And I think we really have to understand that. And uh, so let me just lay out a very simple sequential model. This is, I guess, can go very quickly because you're all, you've either been, you're either economists or have been around economists long enough to absorb these notations. So here, this is just an optimal idea, a, a notion that if you go on, if you ask, well, what's the decision in each node? You go on if some net perceived value is positive. There's nothing more basic than that. And I gave you an example in the structural case. We would write down the value functions explicitly. Here, we're going to actually make it a much more simple uh, representation, but we're going to embody this idea. Now, the important thing, and this is something I think Gary would welcome, is that this choice, this framework that we're going to talk about, is going to be consistent with lots of what, quote, might be irrationality. There's no need to assume that people have perfect foresight. There's no need to assume that people don't make mistakes or that there aren't substantial transactions costs. But there is a notion that people are subjectively doing their best, given whatever they perceive. They could be schizophrenics. They could have all kinds of mental disorders, and that's going to be consistent with this equation. So there's no notion of rationality. So we're going to approximate this with a separable model. I won't get into all the details. But, uh, and then we're going to consider a variety of labor market outcomes. So I'll, let me just say that we have then allowing lots of different outcomes associated with different levels of schooling. So we have multiple sorting outcomes. We have different schooling levels, and we have different outcomes associated with the schooling levels. Let me just leave it at that. And then we allow there, and this is a point that's new, we allow there to be measurement of both cognitive and non-cognitive skills directly measured from a variety of behaviors. I won't get a chance to go into it unless there are questions on it. But basically, this can, again, be non-parametrically estimated. There's no parametric structure imposed in anything that we're doing here in principle. In principle is the key word, because in practice, generally, all of these require some kind of functional form or uh, assumption. But they're very robust, and you can explore with it. And what I'm proposing is actually going to be quite simple and easy to do. Now, it turns out that these kinds of measurement systems, we think about both measuring both cognitive and non-cognitive skills. We have measures of ability. We have measures of sociability. We have measures of various kinds of time preference and other measures that are extracted. Um, and we can basically, however, and this is where I want to point out, that there's no need to take an exact position on these equations. What you can do is literally look at the structure of, uh, you can extract and say, with, if I'm only interested in causal effects or a variety of causal effects, what are those? OK. And, and I don't need to take a position and identify these individual factors. With additional assumptions, we can identify those individual equations. And we have multiple sources of identification. And this kind of unifies, again, the treatment effect literature and the structural literature. One is conditional independence, what some people call random effects models, saying conditional on a random effect, all these outcomes are independent of each other. Okay? Uh, and we can actually think about this. If you think about it very closely, you'll see this is very, very closely identified with what is also called matching in the treatment effect literature. So if you want to think of it as a matching assumption, you're saying, well, conditional on some unobservable theta, which we proxy, and we allow the, those to be mismeasured. So we have proxies, but they're in, we allow for un, these random effects. We proxy those random effects. So it isn't just a, an unspecified mystery. We're going into the error term and asking, where do those come from? Again, I think Gary was very strongly supportive of this kind of activity. But then it's matching on mismeasured variables. And we don't rely exclusively on matching, but we also allow for instrumental variables. So we apply the different strategies. And we can examine the relative strength and weakness of each of these strategies. And I would just point out that we don't really have to identify any particular thing and call it ability or non-cognitive ability. What we can do is actually uh, identify this, the span of those factors. OK. So we then, what can we do from this model? Well, since we have these, we can identify what are standard in the literature on treatment effects, the average treatment effect which is just going to be the difference between 
uh, one outcome and another outcome of two different schooling levels, S prime and S. Now, again, like in the structural models, we can actually identify that for the whole population, or we can do it for subsets of people who are at the choice. And that turns out to make a difference, actually, in some of the equations. More interestingly enough, I think, is, is to go on to the dynamic treatment effects. So at each node, individuals are going on to the next step. And so we can ask, what's the treatment effect by fixing uh, schooling and asking, do you go on to the next step? If you're deciding, say, at J, are you going to go on to J prime for people who are at that node? So it's not some counterfactual that's way out of the sample. It's for people who reach that node, who decides to go on and who doesn't go on. So we can condition on this. And then we can also fix. So we're doing these two different ideas, a causal act and also a conditioning act. And we can, again, define the treatment effect for people who make that transition. And we can decompose that effect to get at the idea of how important this future option value component is into a direct effect and to a continuation value. How much time did Eddie give me? Um, we can also, uh, <laughs> I have a few more minutes, right? Unless my watch stopped. Um, which it probably did, but all time will stop. But there are other marginal effects that I think are closer to what Gary would want to do and, and I think was very supportive of. And that is, what are the effects of people at the margin? Not just some average for people, some hypothetical group of people. But for people who are at the margin, what's the additional effect? What's the effect of additional level of schooling for people who are at the margin of indifference? Since we can estimate these decision rules, we can actually estimate those individuals who are that set of individuals in terms of their unobservables who are basically at risk to take the decision and who are just indifferent. And so we can actually compute an average marginal treatment effect, which is not the same as a, the so-called late, and then a policy-relevant treatment effect, which is the treatment effect for those induced to change a policy. Okay, so I, we can discuss all this. We can, we can do it. So we have the National Longitudinal Survey of Youth and uh, we have a variety of outcomes. I'm only going to focus on these four that I put up. But we, can, we have basically estimated causal effects for all this variety. The framework is very flexible and for that reason allows a lot of exploration. So in terms of the latent endowments, and we do take a position on those endowments, we find that the overall correlation, the, the un underlying endowments are not normally distributed. Uh, they're highly non-normal. Uh, they have two endowments. It turns out that's enough to, to capture all the treatment effects in the literature uh, that we find uh, that are inconsistent with these data. And so let me just show, go through this very, very quickly since uh, time is limited. What we can show then is basically what is the importance of both ability and this motivation that Eddie was talking about and who goes to high school and who drops out of high school. And what this graph is doing is basically showing, these plots are doing, these are the marginals of this joint distribution. And what it's showing is you go from the bottom to the top, the bottom to the top, how the probability of graduating high school increases. And you can see it's increasing in ability. Ability is a strong sorting device. Same thing is true for who graduates from high school, uh, going on to college, who gets a four-year degree. So a lot of sorting. And there's strong effects of these cognitive and social, so there is strong effect of ability. Smart people who graduate four years of school are still getting higher returns than dumb people. Okay, And there, there are definitely strong effects of that sorting. We can look at the causal effects from this literature as well. So what are the causal effects? The causal effects are basically comparing one group next to the other. I, initially, I showed you the group against high school dropouts. Now what I'm doing is showing you the marginal gains. And the solid, so the observed, the solid line, the dark line, is basically that part which is the data. Okay, It's showing you what exactly uh, the, the raw effect is. And then the causal component is the light area. And so you can see substantial causal effects. But a big chunk of that treatment effect is still ability. There's still these unmeasured ability components. And there's no denying that that's important as well. That's true for present value of wages. It's true for health limits work. And it's true for smoking as well, with different degrees. I mean, the causal effects of the ability bias, if you will, the strong education effects on, on health. And I think that's uh, been found and reported in various other literatures. But here we can actually isolate the components. And we can also look at treatment effects by decision node. And so the treatment effect by decision node is essentially, um, uh, here we are looking at the average marginal treatment effect. And if you just look over here, you can see the effect that I was talking about. This group here, who graduates most from college? The high ability individuals. 
the low ability individuals are actually getting negative benefits. They're not statistically significant in this, but you're getting negative, and these are gross benefits. See, the full rate of return to require that we compute full cost. And we get similar patterns for other outcomes. I'm not going to get a chance to do so. And we can look at it, we can decompose these treatment effects. And here I'm just showing this for present value of income. So what we show is substantial effects of both cognitive and non-cognitive effects in producing this notion of transition-specific average treatment effects. So there are strong components. There is an average causal effect due to education, and then there are these other components which are important as well. Now, what about uh, ex post continuation values? What, what we found is substantial effects of uh, uh, continuation values, substantial estimated gross continuation values. These are ex post. Ideally, you'd like ex ante to consider schooling decisions. And here we can go through, just looking at this one notion of present value of wages, what we see is substantial and significant components of, uh, the, so the direct effect is in the light shade. This is now taking the total treatment effect and decomposing that further into the components that are actually due to uh, a continuation value and those that are not. So both enrolling college, the real benefit isn't just stopping with the first year or two in college. It's the premium you get from, from going on and finishing the continuum. And we can compute distributions of treatment effects, which aligns us with work by Willis and Rosen and others, showing that there's a lot of heterogeneity and a lot of sorting. Um, and then, just to conclude, we have, some other con we have some other findings. For example, linearity in schooling, which became kind of a touchstone throughout the whole literature. What can we say? Well, I'm using the same kind of format, except now I've added that I started with. But now what I'm saying is, suppose we put in linear schooling. OK, so the fourth column here in each of these figures, this is the format I used at the beginning. The fourth column is basically an effect that says, what are the causal effects of schooling above and beyond linear schooling effects? And in fact, there are strong effects. So nonlinearity is very important. And I'll just show you a graph showing how log wages uh, are you know, nonlinear in terms of the average treatment effect, log present value of wages, and the like. So there's a lot of robustness. I won't be able to go through that. I will point out, though, and this is where the literatures come together. So instead of this acrimonious conflict between structural and treatment effect literature, if you think about the random effect models, which a lot of structural models are using, that's a form of matching. You're saying that I'm matching on some unobservable. This, in some cases, you sort of integrate it out, if you want to call it that. But it's a form of matching. And we can actually then, and unlike a lot of the work in the structural literature, we take out some of those unobserved components and can match on them. And what you can see is if you're only interested in things like the average treatment effect, what you're going to find is that the structural methods and the matching approaches are going to align very, very closely. These are the columns, of the, 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 the final two columns here on the right. This is what's given from our approximation to a structural model and matching, which almost has to happen if this conditional independence assumption, which also used in matching holds. So that suggests that if I'm interested in certain questions, I can use very simple traditional methods. And again, the conflict is, is breaking out. So I'm going to have to uh, stop with talking about the uh, policy relevant treatment effect. And here we can use this. Unlike saying, here's my late or here's my treatment effect and that's it, we can actually consider what a two-year tuition subsidy would do. And so what we find is that this, we change tuition. 13% of people who graduate from high school uh, uh, enroll in, in, in college. Uh, and so there's a real shift. And we can look at what the effects are on things like wages, present value of wages, health. So the health limitations are substantially reduced, and smoking is reduced. But more than just saying there's an effect out there, we can also say where out there, who's affected. And here what we find is, yeah, in terms of the distribution of those factors leading people to go to college or not go to college, we're getting the biggest effect for people like in the center of the distribution. And what we're finding is very weaker, weaker effects overall at the different margins, at the, at the beginning and the end. And so we can actually identify who the winners are, who the losers. And we can also find out that a, among those people at different quantiles of this latent ability distribution, which determines who goes to school and who doesn't, who actually goes on to uh, finish college and graduate. A lot of the high ability people do. A lot of low ability people are not, which is the point that I was making earlier. So I'll just uh, say that, again, because we, can, we talk about how we expand uh, and change these, uh, these non-cognitive abilities, and we can quantify that under some additional assumptions, 
we can then link this to some earlier work. Gary's work and the students' work certainly influenced my own work that uh, there, there, there are very important contributions of early family life to promoting both cognitive and non-cognitive skills. And here we can say, well, we found these. We measured those in other studies. So here we can simply say, suppose that we take and we promote uh, ability, and we do it in ways that are consistent with some other findings in the literature. We do this policy experiment. What do we find is the effect of boosting people at the bottom of the distribution, where many of these programs have been targeted, and what are the gains that occur in terms of log wages, present value of wages? And we can see substantial contributions, both cognitive and non-cognitive components, and also in terms, of, in, in terms of present value of wages, log of wages. And we can also see that there are effects on health and, and smoking. So let me just summarize. And the summary is that what we've tried to do is unify two different approaches that are sometimes viewed in the literature as very antagonistic. I know Gary and I ran a workshop in the last few years. We had a lot, mostly for graduate students and uh, people who were very early on in their careers. And they would give these informal talks. And there was a wide range of ideas, a wide range of methodologies that were there. And Gary was, in all of his work, was very open to different approaches. He wasn't sort of saying, you know, he had to do it this way. Everybody has their own favorite style. He really was open to the idea of anybody who was sincere and serious, he wanted to hear that literature. But I think what would be useful here, and it's too bad he's not here to really see this, is we can, we've done here, we've kind of tried to combine these literatures to get the best of both and to know what the next steps might be in formulating more articulate structural models. And those steps are being taken. So we developed a unified approach to the literature on variety of so-called causal effects. The causal effects literature does not answer Becker's question, which is a basic question, which requires us to really evaluate those value functions, to really understand what is the expected value, what information sets, what is the ex ante gain that individuals expect. That's not identified from an ex post gross gain. Wasn't fully appreciated 50 years ago. Now we appreciate it more, and we're actively working on it. I think, though, there's strong evidence that when we look at that answer, that question, we look at the causal effects not just on earnings, but on other components as well. Smoking, depression, health limitations. I haven't shown you all of those. The causal effects vary by level of education. There's a lot of sorting on gains. And a lot of the sorting is mostly showing up in later educational decisions. I didn't really show you that. The idea of linearity, which is very popular. I know it's easy to use in calibrated macro models. But nonetheless, that's decisively rejected. And the continuation values, an important idea of dynamic economics, turn out to be very important. So these are the ex post continuation values, and ex ex ante. To go back, we need to go further. But what this means is that the traditional internal rates of return, if anything, underestimate. If we count the continuation value for those who benefit, or their positive continuation values, for those, who, or those at certain margins who go on to benefit, the traditional internal rate of return estimate, underestimates the rate of return to schooling, high as that was. There's substantial sorting on cognitive and social and emotional skills, and there's strong effects of these cognitive and non-cognitive skills besides their effect in education. And so contrary to what seems to have become a literature in some areas, there is ability bias. There's no question. If we look at the raw difference, ability bias is important. We can make a partial way to sort of understand what those components of ability bias are. So we can interpret those. Instead of just saying there's some unspecified ability, not just IQ, these motivational factors were very important. And if you read Gary Becker's 62 paper in the JPE, he mentions these things very explicitly. But for most outcomes, only high ability people are graduating from college. And there, for that reason, the idea of universal college education, which has been advocated by many people, simply is at odds with any, any kind of reasonable specification that allows for heterogeneity. So thank you very much for your attention. I guess we have a little bit of time, right? Jim, you know, that's commendable. You got through 92 slides. Um, <laughs> pretty amazing. Uh, but you went pretty fast. So I want to make sure I understood yes, yes. Uh, a Sorry. couple of the things you said. Now, you mentioned at the very end that there is ability bias. And when I, when I think back of this literature on human capital and estimating rates of return, you know, I remember that and you mentioned the late literature. Uh, if you think about, say, Josh Angris' work. Uh, right what, 20, 25 years ago, something 20 like years that. Ago, 20 years ago. 20 years ago, where he used one approach to estimate rates of return. And I remember seeing a survey by uh, Orley and uh, CeCe Rouse right. that basically said, no matter how you do this, you keep getting 
pretty much six to eight percent rates of return on human capital and that it's not related to ability. There, that the ability bias that people always worry about being there basically doesn't show up. Josh's work, same. So I, I just want to get you to come back and clarify one thing. There, there are three reasons why that could be the case. One is that they're not taking into account the continuation value appropriately. Second is they're not using the right dependent variable, so they're thinking only of wages and not maybe the health outcomes or some other outcomes. And third, they're wrong. And I wasn't quite clear <laughs> which one you, you were emphasizing, so maybe you could clarify that. Okay, no, that's a very helpful question. Uh, and uh, let me just uh, try to emphasize. Uh, see, the literature, see, I, I would object to saying that a lot of those estimates that Orley and others talked about were actually rates of return, any kind of sense. We actually write down an economic model and ask, well, you know, what, what we really want to do for the agent is to know what is the ex ante rate of return on which that person acted. So the, for understanding the decisions of that person, we'd like the ex ante rate. That involves information processing. It involves the person knowing the own ability. Uh, what was reported in the whole literature was basically an ex post rate. Okay, that's part of it. But it's more than that. It's also this other component, which is that the ex post, that, th that these rates of return didn't really capture the full costs. So for example, one of the conundra of the literature was that you would find that if you computed the rate of return by using the, the, the internal rate of return, just discounting earnings off census data, you found incredible rates of return. Petra Todd and uh, Lance Lochner and I estimated like 50% rate of return for high school graduation. And yet high school dropout rates at the time were actually increasing in the United States. So you said, wait, how could we do that? And so how do the structural equations estimate, resolve that? Well, they would bring it in by saying, oh, there are huge psychic costs. And people who don't go to school are the ones who have high psychic costs. But that's, okay, that's fine. But I mean, it's logically consistent. But then it kind of leaves the burden. And it's not just foregone earnings. It's not just tuition. People talk about tuition. It's literally in the structural models. One feature that comes out is basically the structure of, of, of the psychic costs. They classify individuals. Work that I've done, work by Violanti and McGeer and, and others. There are a lot of papers that showing and essentially intrinsic in Wolpin's work, his types, showing high psychic costs, although he doesn't call it that. And so that's an unsatisfactory feature of the model. And now people are relaxing now by trying to get rid of some of the risk neutral assumptions that have been made in the literature and so forth. So I'd say it's not a rate of return, what they've said. I'm not denying that, that, that when we correct for ability and we do it in the usual way, we're still going to get high rates of return measured in the traditional way. I'm going to argue that those would actually underestimate the rate of return. Okay, But the missing link is actually understanding the full aspect of what the, of what the quantitative importance is of these psychic costs. And in other work that I've done and people, it's an active area of research, if we look at those psychic costs and try to relate that, to various measured abilities, both cognitive and non-cognitive abilities, it's not the full story. There's something else still out there that's missing. So that's why I say it's an unfinished project. It remains a question for the future. So I don't think there's any contradiction. There is a rate of return such as they measure it. I don't know if it's the rate of return that would come from properly writing down a value function and computing the rate of return, okay? But you can, so I don't think there's a real contradiction there, so. Uh, Jim, I, I had a question just in terms of when you have the non-financial components of things, yes. when you calculate rates of return, whether you really want to include those, change the discounting rate on those elements at the same time, because a lot of those are calculated based on people's, like take health, I'm willing to pay for a longer life. Those are calculated based on what I'm willing to pay as of today. Right. And therefore, if you gave me the choice of doing the college education or doing an alternative investment with your rate of return, I don't think you'd get the right answer because that guy's not going to change his discounting on those future years if in, that, in that other specification, right? I'm willing to put a dollar in today. I get some amount back in dollars in the future. Right. But I'm also going to get this psychic benefit in the future. Correct. But that doesn't adjust as you adjust the alternative rate of return, right? So you don't want to, you don't want to discount that at this hypothetical rate of return. You want to discount it at what he's willing to pay as of today, which isn't going to change. Right, right. but I mean, I, you're going back to this notion of like computing an IIR off yeah, of the... Yeah, that's dangerous to do. That's what I'm for, saying. For, for, for these kinds of Correct. things. Once you have non-psychic things, 
you really got to be careful that you not just do some naive rate of return calculation. Correct. Because you'll get very misleading results as to what people would really be willing to do. Exactly. Like whether they would say, look, I would choose this over a financial investment. You want to make the IIR calculation reflect that choice. Correct. And if you don't, if you do it the wrong way, you won't get that. I agree. If you write down the value of I skipped over this, and very and actually, it's not in Wolpen and uh, Keen, but it's in later later versions. You'd want to incorporate in part, part of the returns, the health benefits, and so again, in the, like in, in some of the other psychic benefits that would occur in the future benefits, then you could actually compute a marginal rate. So part of it is that at each stage, at each decision stage, right, I would be changing the nature of the return. I would actually then want to take that into account as I updated my information. And so it's not like a single rate of return that I would compute sort of, but I'd want to be able to do that ex ante at each node to understand who went, and then ex post, after the decisions were made, I'd like to incorporate all of those costs, say at the end of the life, the guy would say, well, was this a good thing to have done or not to have done? But there are a series of, of rates of return that we could think of computing, right? But they'd be embodied, I think, in the value function. And you could write down, right, a marginal return at each age that includes the kind of current and future return at each of those ages, uh, uh, including psychic cost as part of the benefit stream, right? The reason I would say, the reason I would, would emphasize this is that if you look at health benefits, a lot of the benefits accrue very late. Correct. And if you, if you evaluate the value that people would place on those by adjusting the rate of internal discounting of those benefits, you greatly understate the benefits that they receive compared to, say, an equivalent financial investment today. Because their valuation will be discounted at their time preference rate, right. not at whatever this alternative investment rate that you're calculating the internal rate of return on. Well, but I mean, again, I'm not sure the internal rate of return is a very reliable tool. That's what I'm think. saying. It's exactly, exactly okay, what fine. I'm saying. Exactly. So okay, you want to look at some net yeah. return above the cost of capital, which would then handle it correctly. Correct. Right. And that's, I think, embodied in the notion of the valuation function. And it just is very important when you do health, because once you start saying, I got, I got to have a 15% internal rate of return, you've greatly understated present willingness to pay for improvements in health. Correct. But I, but I think also what people are not, see, there are some components. I didn't get into this, but in, there's a way to use these results to get an aspect of how much of these benefits people actually did anticipate. So you can go one step further. And there are certain components like health, some of the health benefits where people seem to understate at the time they're making the decision what the benefit would be. Part of it's maybe this, this discounting, this time preference. Part of it maybe you just simply don't know. You know, you're going to get these benefits uh, at the time you make the decision. But I completely agree with the, the thrust of the question. If I could just add a, a, a follow-up. I'm, I'm curious about how you're going to confront uncertainty going forward in this because, you know, even once you start looking at financial market returns, there's big discussions about what prices of risk are and stuff like this. And here we're facing certain types of uh, uh, investments which there may not be financial alternatives and ones in which there are. And so how, how do you confront this? I'm, not, I'm never quite sure in these uncertain environments what we mean by rates of return in this sense just because of the treatment of uncertainty. But. Well, notice I, I was backing off the rate of return. I said that we couldn't <laughs> answer it. <laughs> so what you're, which in some sense you're all doing is saying that kind of the, the original formulation, which was very attractive maybe 50 years ago, in light of the way we think about dynamic decision making now, I do think we've revised that and we were maybe a little smarter about it. Uh, but that's a, that's a huge question in terms of embodying the uncertainty. Notice, by the way, there is a rate of return up there. That's the R, <laughs> I think. Uh, 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 but I mean, that's where I think we've made a lot of progress. But uh, I, I completely agree. Here, we didn't really take, and, and this is where the, the literature has gone. There are people who've talked about aspects of uncertainty. So like Archie Diacana, when people are learning about, you go to college, and part of what you're doing when you go to college is you don't know how good you are and what you're good at. And so there's some uncertainty. That you can quantify in terms of like a model of Bayesian learning about your ability. But these other larger terms, things like you know, learning about what the rate, you know, People like uh, uh, Bushinsky and others have tried to examine what's the effect of uh, my uh, uncertainty about future labor market returns on my current decisions. All of that uncertainty has kind of been swept through the literature, the treatment effect literature. The structural literature has taken a position on it, but when I write it out, see, this is one of the problems, that the more I say, uh, 
the less you like it. The more explicit I am, everybody says, I don't like that assumption. I don't like that assumption. I don't like that assumption. Yes, but it facilitates interesting communication. It does. It makes, <laughs> it makes for great papers and good discussions. But there is something that the, the, the slogan, let sleeping dogs lie, actually <laughs> has actually dominated the treatment effect literature. And I think that's, so what I'm trying to do is bring them out. I, one thing I didn't point out, though, which is something which is probably not so satisfactory, is using this kind of halfway house as a vehicle. We can't examine how far, how sensitive people are to some future streams. It wasn't your health notion, Kevin. This is more the notion of uh, uh, future tuition costs. So one of the findings that emerges from this, which is troublesome in some sense, is if you increase college tuition, you think that will have an effect on high school dropout rates. And it doesn't. I mean, literally, we don't. And that's a question that's, that should be in some, in, some, in some specifications, some of the extreme specifications of the structural model. That should work. That's not imposed in here. We can test that, and it's not true. So that's a fact that needs to be taken into account. There are information processing arguments. It's not that you can't take it into account. It's just that you should. But I completely agree. It's much more interesting to write out this specific economic model. Here we see Gary writing it out in great detail. And, uh, and if he were here now, he would be raising the first set of questions about all of these things. But it would be literally on, this, uh, on these points. So I completely agree with that. So uh, I think we're about ready for a 20-minute break. But before I do so, I want to thank both speakers for a very excellent session. Thank you.